Hey, welcome to Mana Online. We're so glad that you're tuning in. Hey, listen, today we are gonna take communion as a church family. So if you've placed your faith in Jesus for salvation, go ahead and grab something to eat and something to drink. It doesn't have to exactly be the grape juice and the wafer, but as long as it's something that can symbolize the body and the blood of Jesus. We'll lead you in that right after worship. But for right now, let's go ahead and posture our hearts as Mana Worship leads us in a few songs. to praise the name of Jesus and you're able, get on your feet and let's worship. Come on, put your hands together. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, I'll praise when I'm down. I'll praise when
Hey, we're going to go ahead and take communion together as a church family. So go ahead and grab whatever you have there with you. Maybe it's a muffin, maybe it's a cracker, maybe it's just a bagel, and then something to drink. And we're going to take communion together. Really, all of this is about remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're not only looking back, but we're also seeing how that applies to us right here, right now. His promises are true for us today. We can grab hold of the salvation that he has for us. And then we also look to the future, look to the day that we get to spend eternity with God forever. So go ahead and grab whatever you have to eat. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross for us. Jesus, thank you for your life that was poured out for us. You lived a perfect life. You died a perfect death on our behalf. You were our substitutionary atonement. So Lord, thank you. Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken for us. We remember it and we take this in remembrance of you. Go ahead and eat whatever you have. And then take whatever you have to drink. You know, this represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. Scripture says that there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood, but Jesus was the lamb who was slain for us. So go ahead and take what you have to, to drink right there. Lord, again, we thank you for your sacrifice, sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for your blood that you poured out for us. We don't take it for granted. Thank you that it washes us clean so that we can be in right standing with God. We take this in remembrance of you. Go ahead and drink. And now, Lord, we look forward to the day that we get to spend eternity with you in heaven forever in your presence. But now, Lord, we don't just sit on our hands. We, we say yes and amen to everything that you have for us as your church right now. So, Lord, we, we posture our hearts to forcefully advance your kingdom until you return in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for taking communion with us. I want to say again, welcome. It's so great to have you all tuning in. In fact, if this is your first time tuning in, we'd love to hear from you. It's an honor to have you here. In fact, if that's you, even if you need to pause the video, would you text the word guest to the number on the screen? We'd love to hear from you and see how we can serve you best. Also, if you came prepared to give today, we have a couple of easy ways you can do that. You can always give at our website, manna.church, or you can download the Mana Church app on your smartphone, or you can even text the word Mana to the number on the screen. If you prefer to send something in the mail, feel free to look up our Cliffdale site address, and you can send it in the mail to that address right there. All right, well, we're really excited about the sermon series. I believe God has something powerful each for each one of us today, but first, Check out these video announcements. What's up, Mana Church? We have the annual Mana Church Multiply Conference coming up really soon. And I want to invite you to come and be a part. Listen, from the very beginning, from the very first moment that my dad said, we're going to plant an expression of Mana Church near every U.S. military installation in the world. From the moment that he said that, it has become clear and evident that it cannot be just a bunch of paid people who believe we can do this. Really? If I believe we can plant 273 churches, it doesn't matter because it takes all of us. Mana Church Multiply is not just something that a church is doing. It's a movement of people who believe that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus all across the military highway. I want you to come and be a part of experiencing the Mana Church Multiply Conference because in this conference, you get to hear from people who are walking this call out on the military highway. You get to experience people who are part of a local church just like you're a part of. You get to interface with leaders. You get to hear some of the vision of where we're headed. It's really pretty simple. Over a Tuesday night, a Wednesday, a Wednesday night, and a Thursday morning, we're gonna lay out the map of where we are, where we're going. We're gonna talk about some amazing opportunities. You get to hear some great content, and it's really the most inexpensive conference I know that is around. 
How can I be a part, Chris? You can register at manna.church. You can register on our app or don't tell anybody. Tuesday night and Wednesday night, those sessions are free. Make a plan to be with us at the Manna Church Multiply Conference. This is important because our generation is broken and hurting. We know the problems that they're facing. We understand it's, it's hard when you, when you see all these issues, mental health, anxiety, depression, that's, that's running rampant right now. And when we feel like we have the solution, we know the answer is Man, are we doing our job if we're not telling Well, hello, Mana Church. How we doing? Fantastic. I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are in this room, but also in just a moment, I'm going to ask you for some help because all across the military highway and across the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region, we've got people joining us in our city and area. We've got people joining us at microsites in El Paso, in Quantico, in Fort Campbell, wherever you're in the world watching, we're glad you're here. Can we celebrate them? Come on. Well, my name is Anna Wiggins, and I have the joy of leading the Executive Place site. That's one of our multi-sites in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region. And I also, under the oversight of our lead pastor, Chris Fletcher, and the God-honoring men that make up our board of elders, I have the privilege of being a part of the teaching team here at Mana Church. And I am so thankful for them and for their leadership And I'm really excited about the opportunity that we get today to study God's word together. Now, it was a time of unprecedented spiritual activity, the kind of moment that many today crave. There was an explosion of spiritual gifts, and I'm talking about the cool kinds, like prophecy, healing, words of knowledge, and the like. Every spiritual gift was in operation. And if we're honest, isn't that what some of us would crave for today? Wouldn't we long to see that and to be a part of a church where that's happening? In fact, it's what some people actually engage with church for, to experience something of the supernatural, And there's nothing wrong with that because, after all, God is the author of spirituality, which means he is the creator of spiritual gifts. He created them to be a blessing so that through them he would pour out his grace onto the lives of people. It's amazing. And when I think about spiritual gifts and I want to study them and find out what the Bible says about them, I naturally gravitate toward the New Testament, in particular, some of the writings of Paul. Because Paul talks about how the spiritual gifts are to operate within the church, how they're supposed to function. And I think it's interesting, though, that when the Apostle Paul wrote his longest letter, He wrote it to a church that was overflowing with all the expressions of spiritual gifts. And yet, he had a little bone to pick with them. See, he made an important distinction that they needed to understand. You see, Paul had discovered that true, vibrant, passionate spirituality results in many awesome gifts. But spirituality must have a root. It's got to have an order. It must have something at the base, as the foundation. So Paul wrote to this church to talk about order within church gatherings. He had figured out that there were some practical pillars to true spirituality. And throughout this series that we're calling Spirituality, we're talking about five practical pillars of spirituality. In week one, we talked about holiness. Pastor Chris did a phenomenal job talking about consecration, the act of being set apart and conformed into the image of Christ. Not so I can judge others, but so I can look at him 
and tomorrow look more like him than I did today. Then in week two, we talked about solitude, the idea of cultivating withness by routinely disconnecting from distraction in order to intentionally connect with the Holy Spirit. Because if you will learn his voice in the quiet place, you'll recognize it even in chaos. We're also going to talk about love, about baptism of the Holy Spirit, and about service. So today, we're going to talk about love. Now, Anna, I thought you said we were talking about spirituality. What's love got to do, got to do with it? Okay, well, Tina, let me tell you. See, Paul is about to tell the church in Corinth that love is a verb and that there were some things they needed to stop in the name of love. Hold on now, because I imagine when they got the letter, they felt a little shot through the heart. Oh, no. But they're to blame because they gave love a bad name. (laughs) Okay, so I invited a friend home from high school. She came to my house and she went back and told all of her friends that growing, like that being a part of our family for that weekend was like being a part of a musical Brady Bunch. So I can't help it. And if Pastor Jonathan can't uh, sing, he's probably not going to add these in. So he'll give you a joke. But uh, I thought we'd have a little fun. I cannot resist a pun. We're talking about love. There's so many great love songs. Okay, but I will stop in the name of love and invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is so frequently called the love chapter. We read it at weddings. It's on posters and signs and pretty pictures and Hobby Lobby. It's fantastic, right? We put it all over our walls when I was growing up. My parents had four children in five years. So when we hit that uh, adolescent age, they decided we were going to memorize this passage because we needed to figure out how to love one another. (laughs) So I want to invite you to read this with me. Now, here's something that you should know, though. Chapter 13 comes in between chapters 12 and 14, and I know that that's crazy. Like, Anna, you're talking about math here, Um, you know, addition, one after the other. In chapters 12 and 14, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, and he's talking about the way that we use them. And right here in the middle, he talks about love. So let's pick up. Let's begin, rather, in verse 1. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, And if I deliver my body up to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Isn't it interesting that right here, at the beginning of this section, he outlines some of the greatest spiritual endeavors that we could think of. And then making sure that we see this, He says, if you do these things, not that those things are bad. They're incredible things. They're wonderful things. They are right things. But if they're not rooted in love, you've missed the entire point. He's pointing out that the foundation of all spiritual gifts is the practical pillar of spirituality that is love. See, spiritual gifts, when they're rooted in love, are designed to glorify God and to bring those around in a place of glorifying him. And they bring life to people who receive them. But without love, spiritual gifts are kind of like, forgive me for this analogy, but I feel like they're kind of like a bouquet of flowers. 
When you first receive them, they're beautiful. They make you smile. And maybe I'm thinking about this because as I was writing this, I was looking at a bouquet of flowers that had been sitting on my table for about two weeks. You know what happens to flowers after two weeks? If they're cut from the root, they look dead and decrepit and they start to smell. Spiritual gifts were designed to be rooted in Christ, to be rooted in his love. And apart from that, they cannot bring life. It may look pretty for a moment, but it can never bring the life God intended if it is not rooted in love. Now let's keep reading because Paul's going to explain to us what love looks like. In verse 4, he says, love is patient and kind. Now if we were to do a a love test, if you will, take just a quick survey of your life. Could you change your name for love? Put your name in place of love. Anna is kind and patient. You know, I have a great deal of self-awareness, and I think I might actually measure up in that spot, but really if I want to test it, I should probably ask my husband, honey, what do you think? Can, can we replace my name in that sentence? Is Anna kind and patient? You could ask, you could take a moment right now, ask your neighbor. Maybe you shouldn't. See, Paul is going after something here. And he's teaching us what love actually looks like. He's kind of setting the standard for us. And a lot of it has to do with how we treat people. So if you want to know how you're doing with love, take these, this passage that we're going to read and just think about yourself. How are you doing with these actions? He goes on to say, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. This is probably why my parents picked this passage that we were going to memorize. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. There's a whole bunch for us to focus on in this particular section. There's a lot of action. But I want you to also notice that Paul isn't just telling us love acts a certain way. It isn't jealous. It isn't boastful. It's not self-seeking. But he also says it's not irritable or resentful. Love isn't just about our actions, it's also displayed in the attitudes of our heart. And that sounds just like Jesus because he was always after our hearts. Because on the outside, I can look like I'm patient. I can smile and you can think I am the kindest person on the planet. But in my heart, I might be thinking, how dare you waste my time? I cannot believe that you would not hurry. Why, am I, why are you requiring me to be patient? Y'all are laughing because you've been there. <laughs> Love displayed the way that Christ tells us to display it isn't just the actions of our heart, the actions of our hands, the way that we live. It's also the motivations of our heart. He goes on to say, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Love is eternal. Love never fails. That is a statement of fact, and it is our eternal hope. And our spiritual gifts, they are a blessing to us today. But when the perfect comes, meaning when Jesus returns, or when we make our transition from earth to eternity with him, the gifts will no longer be needed. Because we will see him and know him fully. But until then, verse 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. 
Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Love supersedes how we see things. Because the truth is, now as we live and breathe on earth, we see things through a glass dimly. What does that mean? Okay, when this was written, they didn't have mirrors the way that you and I have mirrors. So they would look at themselves in the reflection of something shiny. You don't quite see everything perfectly. You're not able to. You can kind of make it out, make some adjustments here and there. But if you've got spinach in your teeth, good luck. (laughs) But when we see in eternity, we will see perfectly. But God speaks to us today, here. Now, let me make something very clear. When God speaks to our spirit, he speaks perfectly and he speaks clearly. There is no confusion in what he says to us. But we don't just hear him in our spirit. We process what he says through our souls. That's through our mind, our will, and our emotions. And sometimes we've got some filters in our soul, some stuff gunking up the works, so to speak, And it causes us to be a little off. Sometimes we're a little wrong in the way that we perceive what God says or we apply what he says. Sometimes we'll we'll think something is discernment and actually it's judgment because we think we're right. And there's no way that we could be wrong. God spoke to me. Like if if it's not rooted in love, it's probably not the way God intended it to be delivered. But that's, that's the key right there. That even though our souls may process things through a filter and we may get things a little off sometimes, there is confidence that we can have as we move forward in love. Because when you demonstrate the love of Jesus and you stop and say, okay, when I go to speak to this person, I want a model and I want my motivation to be Jesus' love for them. You can't get it wrong. Because as you begin to operate in his love for others, it's going to help clean out some of those filters. It'll expose some of those places and it'll help you get right and begin to hear him more clearly. Verse 13, so now faith Hope and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, as I read that last portion, the greatest of these is love. Perhaps your mind goes back to another story, another person saying something very similar. Because the Apostle Paul right here is echoing the words of Jesus. Words that we find in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is speaking with some people and some teachers of the law are trying to trip him up. So they've asked him a question. It's a trick question. Jesus isn't tricked, so he's got the right answer and he's about to teach them something. He's gonna teach it to us as well. Verse 36, they say, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Can we actually read that together? Say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What does that look like? Complete devotion to God. He's talking about agape love here. Not the heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. Like sometimes there's emotion that overflows in our expression of love for the Lord. But not always. In fact, sometimes loving God and honoring God, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it requires something of us that we don't like. Sometimes it exposes some stuff in us. So what does it look like? You know, I think we often 
talk about receiving the unconditional love of God. But have you ever given thought to what it looks like to give unconditional love to God? To love him without condition. I started to think about that. And I wonder if that looks like loving him and obeying him without excuse. That in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, all the ways that I could process the command centers, all the things I, I, the places I would call the command centers of my life, where the decisions happen on how I'm going to live. The place where every thought, every action, every attitude, every conviction, every motivation comes forth. This unconditional love look like in every one of those places, living like God is in charge. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. One of the pastors on our staff here, Pastor Ben Goodman, he loves to say that obedience is God's love language. So if you're gonna display unconditional love for God, putting him first, demonstrating absolute, complete submission to him. That is obedience. That's radical obedience. It's going to require us to obey him when it's inconvenient, to obey him today because he's asked for something today and not put it off for tomorrow. It's obedience without excuse. Now, take a moment, ask yourself, how well do you obey God? Because in asking that question, you're really asking, how, how much do I demonstrate to him that I love him? How much do I love God? When we sing about it, I love to raise my hands. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. But do I live like that if he's looking for obedience? Maybe you're sitting back going, I obey him every time he speaks to me, right away. And to you, I would say, maybe lean in a little bit more because I think he wants to talk to you a little bit more. <laughs> because most of us hear, and it takes a moment, not every time, but there's often a process of wrestling with him, of choosing to come into submission to him. The more often we do that, the faster we can do that. The more he's glorified through it. He receives our worship through our obedience. Last week we said that the key to spirituality is to listen and obey. Now Jesus is going to continue. He's told us what the greatest commandment is. And now in verse 39 he says, And a second is like it. Read it with me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right, man of church, this sounds like we know what we're doing because we love God. And what do we do next? We love each other. We're on our way. So what does love look like? And again, we aren't always talking about these over-the-top expressions of love. What does it look like to love your neighbor? Maybe we're not talking about warm fuzzies, about long crying sessions by the fire. If that's your thing, that's great. If you and your circle of friends feel loved that way, fantastic. But I think we can look to Jesus as the ultimate example of what it looks like to love others without, because again, the word love here is love without condition unconditional love. We see Jesus love us that way. In fact, Paul describes it in Philippians chapter 2. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, our example is Jesus. To love, we're going to have to follow 
Jesus. But in order to do that, we've got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the good news is that we can be. He goes on and says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Jesus, Paul, why you got to talk about being in unity? If we're going to love people, that's another message for another day. But there's a key here. He's saying, you're going to demonstrate love the way that Christ loves. You've got to walk in unity with one another. The good news is Jesus actually prayed for us that we would be able to walk in unity It is possible to do so. He goes on and says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What he's about to tell us is possible because of Christ which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus modeled for us love. But did you catch This part that said he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Even to the point of death on a cross. The most humiliating, excruciating death and execution that was available at the time. To love our neighbor with the love like Christ loved us. To follow his example means to pour our lives out for those around us. Our neighbor, they're not just the ones that we love, not just the ones we like to be around, not just the people we get along with. Jesus poured himself out for us even while we were yet sinners. (laughs) He poured himself out laying down his life in obedience to the Father. Even when everyone around him misunderstood, maligned, was angry, he was face to face with some of the people who despised him, not recognizing that what he was doing was on their behalf. That's the level of obedience that God is asking of us. When he says, love your neighbor without condition. Love them without excuse. What does that look like? What are the ways that maybe you could embrace humility? Where can you put others first? What would the world look like? Can you just think for a moment how our community would be transformed if every one of us If every Christ follower loved the world around them by putting others first. We love to be first. We like you to make special accommodations for us. And yet, the love that God is calling us to says, let me put you first. Instead of seeking my own promotion, let me put somebody else ahead of me. Even when it costs me something, let me put them first. That's what it means to love others. Are we willing to obey God where it really costs? Are we willing to pour ourselves out for others? All right, man of church, we love God. We what? We love each other. And now what do we do? Love the world. Y'all are doing great. That was actually a trick question. See, you thought that's where we were going to go. In fact, that's where I would expect to go when we're talking about love, especially when we're talking about loving others. But before we move on, in fact, we'll we'll cover that another day. I want us to go back to Matthew 22, verse 39. 
Because there's something more that Jesus says when he's talking about loving our neighbors, and I don't want us to miss it. I don't want us to skip past it. Let's look at it one more time. What does he say? He says, you shall love your neighbor. We have it. All right, can you guys read this with me? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. yourself. Well, I'm good talking about love when all the arrows are pointed out. But it feels a little bit awkward, maybe prideful, when we get to that, like, as yourself part. What does Jesus mean by that? I mean, when the arrows are pointed out, we're putting others first. That's a comfortable spot often. Yes, we've got some work to do. It's not always easy. But if Jesus is the one telling us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we know how he defines love. Love is not self-seeking. Love doesn't put itself first. It's not selfish. So if Jesus is telling us to love others as we love ourselves, there's got to be something to this. Now, I know we live in a time when self-love is really, really popular, and there are lots of voices around you that can give you insight on how to better love yourself. And I'm not going to stand up here and say that all those voices are wrong and that all the things that they tell you are wrong, but it's always interesting to me that the steps that they take and often prescribe are possible in and of yourself and often are completely devoid of the cross. And the love that Jesus wants us to walk in is love that cannot be separated from the cross of Jesus. It cannot come from within ourselves. So I don't want to talk about self-love. As we close today, and don't think that they're about to start playing the piano right this moment, that's preacher speak, forgive me a few more minutes. Um, I want to talk about the love of Christ rightly received in our hearts. So here's a question. I know you guys are like, you keep setting us up, Anna. I don't want to answer this question anymore. But do you love who God made you to be? I know many of us, we live without even liking ourselves. I have a really good friend who's been going through a really, really hard situation for a number of years. And she's been in a really dark place. So sometimes, like, she loves Jesus, and she knows he loves her, but we'll talk. Sometimes I'm like, okay, come on. What do you like about yourself today? There's nothing. Nothing that she can name. And there are times when we find ourselves in that place. When we can't think of something that we like about ourselves, much less love, about ourselves. And that's because we see only in part, and we've got filters and how we receive the love of God. There are lies that we believe, ungodly beliefs, things that set themselves up against what God says about us. And here's the thing about that Love your neighbor as you love yourself. How can you possibly love someone else who's in the same place that you criticize about yourself? Sometimes there are things from our past that have caused wounds. And what we don't realize is that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks Everything that we do flows out of our heart. So if there are places where we have wounding that we haven't allowed God to bring healing to, that's going to overflow into what we do. We might think we've got it under wraps, but I bet the people around you begin to see it. I've heard sometimes from people, they say, you know what, the past is in the past, I love Jesus, it's covered in the blood, I'm not worried about what's behind me, let's just go forward. And part of me says, yes, that's really good. Because we don't want to be held back by our past, 
But the reality is we don't want to be held captive by our past either. And if we resist the Holy Spirit when he's putting his finger on some of those places, we're also resisting the grace and the healing and the redemption that he has that he wants to pour out in our lives and in our stories. Maybe you look in the mirror and you don't like who you see. Maybe it's because you look a lot like the dad who left you. And when you see that picture, you see yourself, you just see him staring back at you. What do you do when you're in that spot? God wants to bring healing because those unresolved wounds from our past impact our present and our future. I know revisiting old wounds is not comfortable. It's not easy. And yet there's so much grace. There is comfort to be received. Maybe you recognize there's some places that need some healing. How does God want to do that? How is he going to bring healing to your life? Do we pray about it? Yes, absolutely. Look, if I fall off this stage right now and I break my leg, I want some of y'all praying for me. Wayne Tate, come on, let's pray for a miracle. But then I also want you to take me to the hospital. Guardians, could you rush me off? I'm going to need a doctor to set this if Jesus doesn't miraculously restore this. Sometimes the pain from the past, the wounds of the past, sometimes the lies we believe, sometimes in prayer, God's going to just set things right. But often God plans to heal our souls by using others in the body. Galatians chapter six, verse one says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is a principle that's true for sin, that God wants to use others to help us get out of habitual sin. But if it's true for that, how much more is it true for our emotional healing? Jesus died. His blood was shed for our healing. Not just physical, healing from the ravages of living in a fallen world. And he wants to use the body of Christ to help us heal We get whole in community. Life change happens in relationships. I've experienced this. I don't love even saying this. It's like, ooh, it's uncomfortable. But for a lot of time, a lot of years in my life, I've struggled with self-image. And I have often put myself down because I don't like what I see or it doesn't reflect the way I think I should look or act or be. And I remember one day I had tried something on and it just wasn't working. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. And I insulted myself. And I was like, oh, this is, I'm so, you know, whatever. And I heard my husband say, don't talk about my wife that way. Y'all, he is the most kind and patient man I know, genuinely. But he was not being kind or patient in that moment. He was being kind. He wasn't being patient in that moment. (laughs) He was calling me out for a lie that I had believed. And as I heard him say those words, don't talk about my wife that way, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said, if he feels that way about you, how do you think I feel about you? When you say that, you're talking about my daughter. You're talking about my bride. And it was one of those things, I wouldn't have received that 
on my own, God used someone else in one of those tender places in my life to expose a lie that wasn't just something I believed about myself, it was something I believed God believed about me. And God allowed through that relationship, he began to bring healing. You need to be in relationship because God wants to transform. He wants to bring life, healing, and wholeness. There is comfort you have yet to receive. There is healing you have yet to receive. And man, his blood doesn't just cover our sins. Like the best part is that he, he redeems and restores what you could never imagine could be made right and made whole. So what steps do you need to take? For some of us, you need to get in a small group. Some of us might need to go a little bit deeper and you need to walk with a mentor or a pastor to get some biblical counseling for a season. Some of us might need a counselor with the right training, the right understanding and experience. For those places of trauma, you might need to see a trauma specialist. Prayer is good, but God wants to use the body to help heal the soul and heal the mind. And some of us may need a physician. Whoever it is that you need, know that God has placed them in the body for your help and your healing. Take the step. He's given so many gifts to us. Resolve today to heal the pain of the past, to find wholeness, because when we do, the world will be revolutionized as we love our neighbors as ourselves. Would you pray with me? Lord, the reality is that we can't see ourselves perfectly clearly without you. No measure of self-awareness will help us see ourselves perfectly, but Lord, your spirit can illuminate every place inside of us that sets itself up against you. And so Lord, right now, and not just today, but as we continue walking with you and spending time with you, Lord, would you highlight those places that you want to bring comfort and healing and restoration to? And Lord, would you give us the boldness through the power of your Holy Spirit to take the steps necessary to get connected with those in the body who are gonna help us walk in and receive the fullness of your healing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna ask you to keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. Healing begins with a relationship with Jesus. Every one of us was born into sin with a broken relationship with God. And Jesus Christ came and he lived a perfect life, but then he died in our place to pay for our sins so that we could be made right with him. Today, if you haven't yet trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you'd like to begin a relationship with him, whether you're in this room or you're in one of the rooms on the other end of this camera at any of our sites, I wanna ask you right now, if you're ready to place your faith in Jesus, to take a bold step, no one's looking around, but would you raise your hand? Hey, listen, if that's you and you wanna make that decision right now, I'd love to pray with you. So wherever you're watching this, wherever you're at, if you wanna invite Jesus into your heart, just pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for your love and thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sins. I ask you to save me. Be my Lord and give me faith to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer with me for the first time, we want to celebrate with you. In fact, all the angels in heaven are celebrating right now. So would you reach out to us, even if you need to pause the video, would you text Jesus 
to the number on the screen. We wanna make sure you have a Bible, see how we can resource you and serve you best as you start this journey with Jesus. Also, maybe you're watching and you'd like prayer. Listen, we have a prayer team standing by. They'd love to stand with you in prayer. So if that's you, feel free to text the word prayer to the number on the screen. All right, Man of Church, we love you guys so much. See you next time.